I've been a forest ranger for going on five years now. I don't feel it's necessary to disclose my location, so please don't ask me where these take place. With that out of the way, I also want to say that I'm no professional when it comes to the paranormal or creatures. I don't have an explanation for most of the things I went through and experienced. Maybe you all can help me with that. With that said, I'll start with the first encounter I had while patrolling the forest where I work. We had gotten a call about a possible wanderer. A wanderer is someone who walks off the path and is either lost or up to no good. I can't tell you how many teens thinks it's cool to go smoke in the woods out here. Anyway, I took the call and started taking the ranger trail so I could find whoever it was. The description they'd given me was tall and slender. Not much to go off of, but I figured it was better than nothing. I was nearing the end of a specific trail when I heard something off to the east of me. I look over in that direction and saw a quick flash of color duck behind a tree. I call out, Hey, you can't be out here, it's for the forest personnel only. They didn't respond and didn't come out, so I started walking over. I was left speechless when I came up beside the tree I'd seen this figure go behind, and there was nothing there. When you're in the woods, it's not really easy to make it out without being heard. I looked all around, but there wasn't a sign of anyone. I walkied my superior and let him know. He said to do one more run through of the area and if I don't find anything to report back to him. After my second patrol I still found nothing so I did what he asked and reported to him after. He asked what color I saw duck behind the tree and I explained that it looked like someone with a red flannel shirt with blue jeans. He just laughed and said, that was probably Sebastian. I was lost. What do you mean? Is he just void of punishment? Kind of hard to punish a ghost. I shot him a skeptical look. Sebastian was a young kid who was attacked by a bear out here nearly 15 years ago when I first started. He's never really left. From that day forward, I saw Sebastian a handful of times. I've also seen a few apparitions here and there. The most notable being I was giving a tour of the campgrounds we have out here. There was a small group of people with me when a woman raised her hand and asked, Are we allowed over by the river? She then pointed over to the bank where I saw a woman in a white nightgown. Uh, yes, however we require that everyone who can't swim or is not a legal adult to wear a life jacket. You can't swim in it either as the current is very strong, however the life jackets are a safety precaution. I called out to the woman near the bank. Ma'am. Do you mind joining my group up here? You really shouldn't be down there. Her head turned to face me slowly, and when it did, I felt all the color drain from my face. She didn't have any eyes. They were just black pits. A few of the people in the crowd gasped, and a few kids hugged their parents in fear. I looked back at the group, and they looked at me for an answer, but I didn't have one. When I looked back, the woman was gone. We just continued on with the tour after that with a palpable awkwardness and uneasiness. When people find out I work where I do, I'm often asked if I believe in Bigfoot. The short answer is, no I don't. My longer answer would be that there are much more things out there, things that are scarier than Bigfoot. Here's my story of one of them. This will also be my last story as it may give an idea to the location of my workplace and I don't want people visiting just because of these stories. That's not a good reason to come out here. The real reason would be to enjoy nature and all it has to offer. And with that said, I'll stop beating around the bush. I was doing another patrol when I saw something run out in front of the patrol vehicle. It's really a golf cart. Thinking I'd hit a fawn or something similar, I hopped out radioing the lead ranger. When he asked for a description, I didn't really know what to say. This thing was about the size of a full-sized German Shepherd but was all black and had a shiny coat. The body type was also similar, but there were no ears and no sign of there even being any. There also wasn't a snout. I don't mean that it was squashed in like an English bulldog, but there wasn't one. The face was flat and pointed with two small slits at the front. The lead ranger showed up soon after we spoke over the walkies. He was just as confused as I was. The wildlife preserve was called and they took it with them to get a better idea of what it could be. 
While they were transporting it, however, some campers got a few pictures of it. These were turned into local news stations and they ran a piece on it in the newspaper. It never made it to television, thankfully. The last I heard, there have been no new updates about what it could be. I hope you all get a little bit of enjoyment out of my stories and maybe even feel like you can share some of your own. Depends on the response to this, I may share a few more, but as of now, I think I'll keep it under wraps. When I was eight, my parents put me in the Boy Scouts. Now, despite what you're about to listen to, I still believe it was one of the greatest things I'd ever did. I loved hanging out in the woods, learning about survival, all that good stuff. Being that a large part of the courses we took were in the woods and dealt with wildlife, you'd expect me to have at least one spooky story. Well, I can assure you that any Boy Scout has at least one, and this is mine. I've been in the Boy Scouts for about a year at this point. We were covering something to do with leaves in the woods. I'm not sure what it was. That's besides the point, though. Once the lesson was over, we were paired up and told to go out and find the biggest leaf that we could. It sounds silly, but it was a ton of fun. We were instructed not to go out of eyesight of the scout leader, but the kid I was with didn't listen. He kept looking back at the scout leader to see if they were looking away, and as soon as they looked away, he booked it into the forest. No. We were taught that if you were ever separated from your partner to blow the whistle they'd given us. That wasn't really going through my head though. I stupidly gave chase calling out. We're not allowed to go out there. He just kept running through. Eventually he stopped and turned to look at me. He had been a few years older than me, maybe ten, so when I saw that he had a cigarette in his mouth I wasn't surprised. My parents did at the time too so I figured it was something adults and older kids do. We need to go back, I said. I can't see the scout leader. He just laughed and took a drag from the cigarette. Fine, I said. I'll just get their attention. I reached for my whistle, but when I pulled it out, he knocked it out of my hand. You better not get me in trouble or I'll beat you up. I took this seriously. I wasn't the biggest kid and being that he was older than me, I assumed he was stronger. He was laughing for a little before he looked behind me and that's when his face went white. I figured the scout leader had found us but it was so much worse. He dropped the cigarette butt and booked it back towards the scout leaders. I ran over and stomped it out. When I turned around to leave though, I saw what it was that scared him so badly. For lack of a better word, it was Bigfoot. It was tall, hairy and smelled like absolute death. The fur on its face and around its hands were matted with what I assume was animal blood. I legitimately peed myself then and there. It wasn't moving so I tried to fight all my logical thinking and ran over to the whistle that was on the ground. I made it to it and blew in it as hard as I could. I'm lucky this thing was slow because it could have taken my head off. The whistle sounded and the creature cried out before running off into the woods. Soon after... I was scooped up by a scout leader, and we were all back at the Boy Scout camp. The leaders gave us a long and stern talking to about forest safety. One thing I remember vividly is when he said, There are some things out there that will hurt you. It seemed like such a terrible thing to say to a child, but I knew he was right. We still went out to those woods after that, but I never saw anything like it again. I had been staying in Japan for about 10 years when this took place. My reason for staying there in the first place was studying abroad. Once my studies were over, however, I ended up going back. I loved the culture and enjoyed just being there. I've met someone now and we're getting married in the fall. Life had seemed pretty figured out. Just the last week though, something happened that caused a lot of turmoil and strain on my relationship. It started when a buddy of mine hit me up on Skype. He, like me, was American but had come to build a new life in Japan. Being five years older than I was, he had been just about to every notable site in Japan and had two kids. We were shooting the breeze for a little while while kind of out of nowhere, he brought up Akigahara. Now, 
I'm fairly certain that most everyone knows what that is. If you don't, then look it up real quick because I'm not going to explain. Basically, he told me that he would pay me 500 bucks if I would go camp out there alone for two nights. My wife, who is native to Japan, could not protest enough. She told me all the horror stories of people going in and never coming out, people being followed home by spirits, all kinds of crazy stuff. I told her I wasn't scared of some silly forest and agreed to the bet. The day I left, she begged me not to go, but I did anyways. I wanted to prove to her that there was nothing to be worried about. Oh, that, and I really wanted the 500 bucks and maybe a little adventure. I kissed her goodbye and headed out. Walking up to the forest is something sinister. While it is beautiful, it's also extremely foreboding. The density of the trees is beyond reason. I'd never seen anything like it. As soon as I stepped in, I was taken aback by it all. It was like another planet. I heard all the wildlife, whether it be bugs or animals. I heard a handful of other people walking around as well. The temperature had dropped significantly. I wouldn't admit to anyone who asked, but I was scared. I told myself it was nothing more than a forest and continued on. My trek through the various trails did eventually lead me to a spot flat enough and secluded enough to camp. It was around 7pm at this point. Night one was a go. Sleep came, but only after a long fight. Everything I heard around me made me jump. I didn't know what kind of animals lived out here and also given the reputation this forest had, I was beginning to get a little worried about those who were in here with me. I woke up on that morning feeling groggy. I didn't want to leave my tent, honestly. I wanted to leave the forest. I decided that I would hike down to the base of Mount Fuji and give that a look. All through the forest, I was taking photos. I needed something to prove to my friend I'd actually done it. I got some great photos of wildlife, some trees, all that good stuff. Halfway through my hike, however, I decided on putting my camera away for the rest of the trip. I heard a woman weeping off to the east of me. I decided to walk over and see if I could help her at all. When she was finally in sight, I saw that she was a young woman, maybe in her 20s. There was another woman, much older, possibly her mother, who was holding her to her chest. They were both kneeled on the ground in front of a body. It was absolutely heartbreaking to see. The older woman made eye contact with me and we shared a small moment. I could tell she was holding back the tears. I nodded to her as a way to say, I understand, it will be okay, and I went about my way. I'm assuming the body they were kneeling in front of was a relative, possibly brother or maybe father. I didn't get a good look and had no plan to. I continued walking, trying to get that out of my head. It was so hard to shake that image though. I took a rest at the base of a tree and just thought about everything. Myself, my fiancé, my friend and mostly this stupid challenge. I left the forest and went home after 20 minutes of deliberation. Let me explain my decision. When I went there I knew what I was doing. I was going to visit a place people regarded as spooky or scary, and while it was both of those things, I feel like I lost light of what else it was. It's a place where those who have lost all hope, all will to move forward, go to end the most precious gift given to us, life. I wasn't looking at it through the eyes of someone like the woman who'd found someone they'd loved. I was looking at it as some sort of attraction you'd visit for Halloween. It was disrespectful, I felt. Over the course of the next few months, I fell into some pretty serious depression. Seeing how quickly life can be taken away from you, voluntarily or not, is a sobering thing. It put me in a state of mind where I believe nothing really mattered. No matter what we do in this life, have kids, get married, whatever, it didn't matter because we lose all of it in the end. This is where the strain on my relationship came from. I wasn't as lovey-dovey as I'd once been. My fiancé and I were fighting all the time. We weren't making love. We even got into a small physical altercation at one point, causing me to storm out of the house. Guess where I went? That forest. I went all the way there and just stared into it, thinking about all I'd seen and all that had been going on. I contemplated going inside, but I knew that if I did, I wouldn't come out. The thoughts I were having weren't good ones. They came and went in waves as I was standing there, but then one specific thought entered my mind. 
the thought of that woman I'd made eye contact with. I remember that. While she struggled to do so, she wasn't crying. She held it in. She was strong. That's what I needed to be. I made it back home to my fiancé and broke down telling her everything. I was eventually put on antidepressants and luckily for me, they've worked wonders. It's been nearly a year on them and I'm thinking of trying to lower the dosage. I've not had an episode of depression in quite a while so I think I'll be alright. So yes, I went back but before you bother asking, no I didn't see any ghosts or hear any phantom voices. Maybe it's because I wasn't looking for them. Maybe it's because they weren't there. I don't really know or care. The point I want to get across here is that if you're going to visit this forest, please know the real reason you're doing it. If you want to get a cheap thrill, it's better to just stay home. Calling it one of the scariest places to visit is like advertising a graveyard as a ride at a state fair. I apologize if this post doesn't fit the horror shtick that is usually on here, but I really just wanted to share this. What I did see in there was something much scarier than ghosts or spirits. It was morality. I saw what people have to deal with when a loved one dies. Something I haven't had to deal with much in my life. Feel free to grill me on the comments for not posting something scary, but I really just had to get this out. Be aware and honest with your reasons for visiting Akikahara and reevaluate your decision. So I'm not really sure how to start this. I suppose I'll just say it. I saw something in the woods. It wasn't a bear or Bigfoot. Everyone knows that's nonsense. On top of that, there will be things I mention later that will disprove that theory, so people, listen all the way through. I was backpacking through an old hiking trail here in town when I came across an abandoned campsite off one of the trails. Now, normally I would leave that kind of thing alone and let those who clean up the trail deal with it. I don't want to be accused of meddling with someone else's things. This was different, however. It wasn't just abandoned, it was trashed. It didn't look like someone simply left it there, it was like someone was attacked. The tent had been pulled off from the ground and flipped completely over. The food was strewn about and there were embers of the fire all around the site still burning. That's what caused me to walk over there. I didn't want one of them to catch a strong wind and send the whole forest into flames. I made my way over and took my time to stomp out all of the embers. I then checked the vicinity around the campsite to see if there was anyone near who may have been staying out here. I went off into the woods calling out for anyone. That was my mistake. I was maybe 20 feet in when I heard it. There was a low, guttural kind of growl coming from deep within the woods. It was like something I'd never heard. It wasn't like a large dog, but at the same time it wasn't like a bear's roar. I wasn't sure what I was getting into. I thought about heading back, but at the same time I wanted to find out if there was someone out there who had to go through that. I would have tried to help them out. As I kept walking, the growl began to grow closer. I kept an eye and an ear out for it, but it was nearly impossible to pinpoint. Eventually, I decided that the person must have left their things there and something came by and tried to snatch it all up and search for food. That didn't answer all of my questions, though. Most all wild animals were afraid of fire. How then was it scattered about like someone had kicked it? I decided this was getting a little too spooky for me so I started back to the campsite. I didn't pick up on it at the time but when I was heading back the growling had subsided. It wasn't until I made it back that I heard it again and what was causing it. I stayed at the tree line hoping this thing wouldn't see me. It was massive. Imagine a bear standing on its hind legs only, totally hairless. This is why it couldn't have been a bear. I'm fairly certain that they don't shed all their fur. Also, this thing was walking, albeit awkwardly. It lumbered around the campsite for a while, searching for more food, I suppose. When it didn't find anything, it lumbered slowly back into the forest. I left and went back home soon after that. I did some research and I can't seem to find anything that matched this thing's description. I'm not sure if anyone knows what it was. I'll try to give a more detailed description, but... I'm pulling from memory here. 
It was definitely the size of a bear. Also, it had to be an animal, and in no way was it human. It wasn't clothed, and I didn't see any human genitalia or any at all for that matter. There were small round ears fixed atop its head and a large, long snout on its face. If anyone can help me identify this thing, I'd greatly appreciate it. It's been stuck in my mind for a while, and I've just never looked for answers this way through fear of ridicule. Please, guys. What was that thing? When I was a kid, I spent a lot of time over at my grandparents' house. Both my parents were forced to travel often for their jobs, so I was dropped off at the grandparents' house pretty often. It wasn't as bad as some kids would expect. These were the days of dial-up internet, so being upset about not having Wi-Fi was non-existent. Kids, like myself, played outside during those times. Shocking, I know. This particular story takes place when I was about 9 years old. It was right around Christmas time and they had allowed me to open one present early, without my parents knowing, of course. I remember what it was and how I felt as well. It was a brand new pair of binoculars. I was a big fan of bird watching as a kid and still am today, but of course I had more time back then. My granddad looked at me and said, I'm going to let you go out into the woods to look for all the critters, but be sure not to go past the creek. Being nine, this kind of went in one ear and out the other. I agreed and headed out. The forest behind my granddad's house was massive and he owned it all. I think my dad told me at one point that it was nine or so acres. I as a kid told myself that I had explored it all. Funny how your imagination can run wild like that. Well this day in particular my mind wasn't running rampant. What I saw was real and I knew it judging by my grandparents reaction. I had been in the forest for a good ten minutes at this point just walking as straight as I could looking for any of the critters that ran around out there. I saw a handful of cardinals and chickadees, but nothing super spectacular. Then, I ran across the creek. It was completely frozen over, of course, but my mind still wondered about trying to think of what could be on the other side. Why wasn't I allowed over there? Of course, it was for safety reasons. Once you're past the creek a little ways, the house is no longer within seeing or shouting distance. In my mind, however, it was the only place I'd see what I wanted to. I wanted to see a bird I hadn't seen, the less common ones. I looked back at the house a few times contemplating my decision and had decided not to go over the threshold and disobey my granddad, but then I heard something on the other side. It was a man's voice. It wasn't scary, I remember. It was warm and inviting, kind of like a good audiobook. I grabbed my attention and, before I knew it, jumped the creek and headed deeper into the woods. I didn't hear that voice again for quite some time and I wasn't seeing any new birds so I was beginning to think this was a waste of time. I decided to take one more look into the binoculars, do a quick 360 and then head back. The sun was starting to go down and I knew if I was out here much longer I'd get into trouble. I pulled the binoculars to my eyes and took one last look and I saw it. It wasn't what I was looking for, it was a man. He was tall and wore a fine black suit. He even had a briefcase with him. Judging by how strong the binoculars were, he could have been a little less than half a mile away. He wasn't doing anything. He was just standing there. The longer I looked, the more apparent of how wrong this was came over me. Why would someone in a suit carrying a briefcase be hanging out in the woods in the middle of December? I was so focused I didn't hear my granddad approaching. Soon, he snatched me up and carried me all the way back to his house, scolding me the entire way. Back home, I sat on the couch and he questioned about what I could have seen that made me disobey him. Through my sniffling and eye rubbing, I could only say, I heard a man out there. His demeanor changed completely and I remember hearing my grandpa gasp a little bit. He crouched down beside me and said, What did he say? He just said, hey and then he was gone i didn't see him until i crossed the creek nearly whispering he responded what did he look like he had a suit and a briefcase 
are you going to tell my mom? He looked up at my grandmother and then back at me. No, no, we're not, kiddo. Don't worry, we're not mad. We were just worried about you. It wasn't until I was much older that I figured out what I saw in those woods. I was 18 and my granddad was in bad health. He wasn't set to pass any time soon, mind you, but he was just very sick. We were visiting in the hospital and when my parents left to get some food, he told me all about what that man was. Apparently there used to be a cemetery on that land before it became overgrown with trees and vines. That man was a spirit everyone referred to as the Undertaker. According to my granddad, he was a businessman, hence the briefcase, but suffered a heart attack during his wife's funeral. Nowadays he roams the woods, looking for the grave of his wife. It was a heartbreaking tale. The reason he was so worried about me at the time is because it said that if you're caught by the undertaker, he'll curse you. You'll fall gravely ill and eventually pass away from cardiac arrest like him. I'm not sure how much I believe that story, but I will say that I'm glad he never looked at me. His back was facing me the entire time. My grandma did eventually pass away, not cardiac arrest if you're curious, but I have kept the legend strong. I tell everyone I know about it and if I ever run across kids in that area while visiting the old house, I make sure to tell them, never go past the creek. Every town has its urban legends and mine was no exception. Ours was about the child snatcher. It's not totally original, I know, but what are you going to do? Nearly everything is a remix at this point. Anyway, the cool thing about this legend is that there was a location behind it as well. The story goes like this. There was a man who lived in my town in the 20s. He was found guilty of six counts of child abduction, child endangerment, and worse. Before he was hung, he swore that he would always be here stalking the woods for any children that strayed out of the boundaries their parents set. Now, parents tell their little boys and girls not to play in the woods because the child snatcher will get them. I believed it when I was a kid. A lot of us did. However, as I grew older, I knew it was total hoopla. There was no way someone from the 20s was hanging out in the woods. The legend lived on, though. One of the kids in our town went missing a few years back. He's still not been found, however... His shoe was found in an abandoned sewer tunnel in the woods. That sewer tunnel was only about a mile from my house. I had ventured out there multiple times using it as a checkpoint and meeting place with my friends. We talked about venturing down there multiple times but never did. We'd open it up, get one good look from the top and close it back up. A few weeks back I decided to quit beating around the bush and just go down there. Obviously no one was living down there would be nearly impossible. All of my friends were busy doing something much more important, so I set out on this quest alone. It was maybe 6pm when I arrived at the sewer tunnel. A little elbow grease and the cover was off. I slowly made my way down the ladder and was soon in the tunnel. It didn't smell as bad as I remembered, but it was spooky. I turned on my flashlight and headed down looking for any sign that someone was living down there. I'd been walking for about 10 minutes and had only seen a few rats, nothing paranormal or monstrous. I was ready to turn back and go home when I heard it. There was definitely something else in there with me. I could hear someone walking around and even saw another light source approaching from the opposite of the tunnel. I shined my light down there calling out, Hey there, is anyone there? At first I didn't see anything. The flashlight I had wasn't the most powerful. The footsteps got closer and the light grew brighter. I called out again. Hey, who's there? The footsteps stopped. I shined my light toward them and finally I was able to make it out. There was a man standing in the tunnel with a broken neck. The light he had was that of an old lantern. I nearly fell down trying to get out of there. I made it to the ladder and climbed up, quickly putting the manhole over as fast as I could. I fell over backwards and just looked at the entrance for a while. I ran through every scenario in my head. Maybe someone was just playing a prank. My friends knew I was going to be down there. 
but how long would they have stayed down there? That could have taken a ton of time to plan as well. There was also the thought that it could have just been a ghost. I didn't want to believe it, but it all added up. The broken neck, the location, the lamp, it all made sense. Like I said at the beginning, every town has an urban legend. I just didn't expect to find out. Mine was real. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, maybe even hear it featured here on the channel. And grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt.com, links in the bio. Thanks so much friends, and I'll see you again soon.